Throughout this video, we're going to do a desktop computer dissection using 3D animation. Kind of like a dissection lab in biology class. But instead, we'll journey through the inside of this computer and disassemble every piece of hardware. We'll then use a microscope and zoom in to give you a nanoscopic view of the transistors and other structures inside. To make this video, we disassembled all the hardware inside a typical desktop computer. We desoldered and removed the components from each of the printed circuit boards and took thousands of pictures. Then, using these pictures, we meticulously 3D modeled every single component from the computer case down to the tiniest resistor. As a result, here's all the hardware that we'll explore throughout this video. It kind of looks like a crime scene where someone viciously destroyed a computer and arranged all the components. But anyways, let's dive right in. We'll begin this journey with the Central Processing Unit, or CPU, which is the brain of the computer. On top, we have the cover, called an integrated heat spreader and inside is a smaller metal package that holds the integrated circuit, which is technically called a die. This die is mounted on a printed circuit board that distributes the 1200 connection points to landing pads that interface with the landing grid array on the motherboard. The integrated circuit inside has a few different sections, but perhaps the most recognizable are the 10 cores where programs and instructions are run. Each core is quite complicated, so here's a diagram laying out the different functional sections. There are dozens of rather complicated elements in this diagram, and you can look forward to a series of videos we're currently planning which will explore computer architecture and how each of these sections work. Let's zoom into a nanoscopic view of the integrated circuit so we can see individual transistors. These transistors are incredibly small only a few nanometers wide, and in this die there are approximately 8 to 10 billion. On top of the transistors are multiple layers of metal wires, with vias rising vertically between the layers. Together, these transistors and wires create a multi-layer labyrinth or highway, resulting in a computer that can execute billions of operations every second. Let's now zoom out and look at other sections of the CPU. To the side of each core is the shared L3 memory cache and ring interconnect. On the far right is an integrated graphics processor which functions as a less powerful GPU. In the top left is the memory controller which sends data to and from the DRAM. And finally on the far left is the system agent and platform I.O. which communicates with the chipset on the motherboard and manages the flow of data between many of the other components in your PC. So with that in mind, let's move on and look at the motherboard. This motherboard is a massive printed circuit board with thousands of wires running inside and a variety of microchips, components, sockets, ports, slots, headers and connectors soldered to it. Perhaps the single most important and expensive component aside from the bare PCB is the chipset. Computer hardware has evolved immensely over the past 65 years and continues to evolve. So the details we show should be thought of as a current day example PC and not as how all computers work. Let's move on and skip over the many different sockets and connectors throughout the motherboard and focus on the Voltage Regulator Module, or VRM, found near the CPU. These components are used to drop the voltage coming from the power supply down to the 1.3 volts used by the CPU. As a result of all the power flowing through these components and their 80 to 90% efficiency, heat sinks need to be placed on top. While we're on the topic of power, this CPU consumes power equivalent to approximately 16 LED bulbs, thus generating a considerable amount of heat, which is taken away by the CPU cooler. This particular cooler uses a pump to circulate liquid through these tubes and into the radiator's channels, which transfers heat to the radiator fins. The fans then help transfer the heat to the air and the cooled liquid returns to the pump via the return loop. The pump is a brushless DC motor, constructed from a PCB, a control chip, and a stator on the dry side, a barrier in the middle, 
and then the permanent magnet rotor and impeller on the liquid side. There's no mechanical connection between the rotor and stator, thereby preventing any leaks of the cooling liquid. Let's move on to the power supply, which distributes power throughout the computer. In here, the main transformer reduces the voltage and bridges the isolation boundary between the primary side high voltage and the secondary side lower voltages used throughout your computer. Here's the control PCB that ensures a stable output voltage and sends adjustment signals to the switching power transistor on the primary side using opto-isolators. There are dozens of other components used to filter the input voltage and generate various output voltages which are then sent to all the different hardware in your computer. For example, an SSD consumes just a few watts, and the connector uses these voltages, whereas your GPU can consume hundreds of watts using these connectors and these voltages. Next, we'll explore the GPU and move on to the graphics card and GPU which is also the brain of the computer. Oh well, actually this analogy doesn't really work very well, but anyway. Opening the graphics card, we see another PCB with the GPU's integrated circuit in the center, VRAM chips all around, and the voltage regulator module on the side. Above the IC is a heatsink with a fan to dissipate heat. And on the side of the graphics card are HDMI and display ports, a PCIe interface, and then on the other side is the input power connector. Let's focus on the GPU integrated circuit, which, similar to the CPU, has more than a thousand solder pads that connect it to the PCB. Opening the packaging, we find the GPU die, which is noticeably different from the CPU. In here are approximately 11.8 billion transistors organized into six graphics processing clusters totaling 28 streaming multiprocessors. Each streaming multiprocessor is composed of 128 cores resulting in a total of 3,584 cores. Each core has sections for integer and floating point arithmetic and sections for queuing in the upper ends and collecting the results, and is far simpler than a CPU core. Additionally, on the die is an L2 memory cache, shared among all the graphics processing clusters, a set of memory controllers that connect to the VRAM located around the processor, and a PCIe interface for connecting to the CPU. When we zoom in to see a nanoscopic view of the integrated circuit, we find something very similar to what we saw on the CPU. With the transistors on the bottom and a labyrinth of multiple layers of metal wires above, all these structures are manufactured in multi-billion dollar semiconductor fabrication plants, or FABs. But that's a topic for a whole different video. So, let's move on. GPUs and CPUs are similar in many ways. However, GPUs have thousands of cores that are limited to basic arithmetic, whereas CPUs have only a handful of cores that perform far more complicated operations. Additionally, CPUs have branch prediction and deep pipelines that optimize the execution of code. Here's a quick example of what GPUs can do. Take this image comprised of 16 million pixels, each with RGB values for each pixel. A simple way to brighten the image is to add 20 to each of these numbers. The CPU has 10 cores and thus performs arithmetic 10 numbers at a time, whereas GPUs distribute the data to thousands of cores, thus performing magnitudes more parallel processing. Let's close this graphics card and talk briefly about the 3D model. Note that this is a slightly older model graphics card because we buy most of our hardware as non-functioning parts from eBay. And then, as shown earlier, we tear them down rather destructively in order to accurately model everything. Additionally, sometimes components shown aren't compatible, such as this motherboard that says DDR4, while the DRAM is DDR5. That said, Modeling and animating everything to make it feel like you're actually inside a computer took us around 500 hours, and we would greatly appreciate it if you could take a few seconds to hit that like button, subscribe if you haven't already, type up a quick comment below, and share this video with someone who will enjoy it.
the CPU communicates directly with the DRAM through memory channels running inside the motherboard. Inside each of these eight DRAM chips is an integrated circuit composed of 32 memory banks, each 8,192 columns wide by 65,536 rows tall. The DRAM temporarily stores data using capacitors and transistors called 1T1C memory cells in 2D arrays that look like this. Data can be accessed within nanoseconds. However, among these eight chips, only 16 gigabytes of data can be temporarily stored. Take a look at our 35-minute video on DRAM. But for now, let's move on to SSDs which permanently store data in 3D arrays called 3D NAND. This array is 100 to 200 layers tall, 32 to 64,000 columns wide, and 32 to 64,000 rows deep. Additionally, within a single SSD chip such as this one, are multiple 3D NAND arrays stacked one on top of the other. As a result, a single microchip can store terabytes of data. However, reading or writing data takes 50 or so microseconds, which is 3,000 times slower than DRAM. Zooming in on a single SSD memory cell, we find a charge trap which stores different levels of charge, allowing for three bits of data to be more permanently saved. Looking at the NVMe and SATA SSD, both have a few 3D NAND data storage chips, a DRAM chip for buffering and holding the data mapping table, and a controller chip. Let's move on and dissect the hard disk drive. Here we have a disk mounted to a spindle with a motor that rotates the disk at thousands of RPM. A read-write head moves across the disk in order to access a single track out of a half million other data tracks. Let's zoom in on the read-write head. The write head changes the direction of localized magnetic domains in a small layer on the disk, whereas the read head senses these changes in magnetic domains. This disk drive is even slower than the SSD, taking a few milliseconds to access, thus resulting in slower read and write times, but costing less per terabyte of storage. Thus far, we've covered all the hardware inside your computer. So, thanks for watching this far. Thanks for watching to the end.